Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 342 for Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Hey, how is, uh, how, how's your playing? How, how's, how are things? I, I asked <laughs> a, a loaded question, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got a lot of things that I, that I definitely want to talk about from some recent gigs, but I want to know how you're how your surgery went and how you're feeling, man. I, like I, I fantastic is the right word uh. to start with. I did not to bury the lead. I, uh, I had the surgery for those of you who didn't hear the last episode. I I've been having an issue with, with weakness in my left arm and, and also my hand. And we sussed out that it probably was related to a couple of lipomas, which are benign fatty deposits that live between the layers of the skin. And I have them all over my body. It's a, maybe a genetic thing. I, we don't know. You know, they, they, there's not a whole lot known about them, I'm told. But um, I went to a physical therapist who ha- also happens to be a friend of mine, and we sussed it out. He noticed that uh, in my both of my arms, m- these lipomas follow the the two major nerves, the radial nerve and the ulnar nerve in the arm, which is weird. He said they're it, not weird, but it, this is not like a thing that that you know, it's known for lipomas to do, but for me, it certainly seems to be the way it is. And he sussed out with me that it, I had at least one, if not more pressing on my ulnar nerve, which would cause exactly the, mm. you know, the issues that I was having. So I had this surgery. My surgeon was not as convinced. I will point out, although I was attributed, I had four of them taken out two around my elbow and two along the arm. I was assuming one of them in the elbow was the reason for this. And my surgeon was like, no, 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 man. Like, I don't want to get your hopes up here. And I was like, well, take it out anyway, man. Like, let's go. And, uh, and so he did, he took all four out and that was Wednesday. I played a little bit Wednesday night, but you know, there was, there was a lot of tension at the stitch sites for obvious reasons, you know, not, not just because there were stitches there, but because there's bandages also there. And so I, you know, I played a little bit Wednesday, a little bit Thursday. I did not play on Friday. And then on Saturday I played and it seemed like on Wednesday and Thursday, it seemed like things were maybe better, but you know, placebo effect, wishful thinking. I, I was aware that those things could very much be factoring in. And then on Saturday I sat down to play and it was the first time that I could play where I wasn't feeling encumbered by like the stitches healing and things like that. I mean, I still got the bandages on. They'll probably fall off in the next couple of days, but um, it was amazing. Like I felt like I, 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 I was definitely playing, you know, what I would call too loud with my left hand, um, you know, hitting the snare much harder than I, I had in the past. And I realized, mm. you know, I had, I had learned to compensate for what I'd had going on. Uh, I, I had more dexterity in my left hand than, than I've had in probably a decade. Like, I really think these things have been impacting me far longer than I noticed. And, uh, the funny part was that my right hand, I hadn't played for like two weeks. I had traveled. I was in, you know, LA for that podcast convention and in Austin for South by, and then I had the surgery. And so, and also I was just sort of bummed out every time I grabbed sticks. So it wasn't yeah. my natural inclination to, to grab sticks. So it had been a couple of weeks since I played my left hand felt great. My right hand was struggling. I I'll attribute that to, I had had a shingles vaccine the, the, like the, you know, 24 hours before. And so my arm was like swollen and hurt. So uh, that was probably the reason, but as we've been going through this, I've, we found a couple on my right arm that are like, hey, uh, this is probably causing you trouble that you don't know about. So I already have an appointment scheduled to get those out once, once our, uh, I'll talk about it, but uh, you know, we've got a bunch of bitter, kill, bitter pill gigs coming up for, um, for this month. So I don't want to mess with, you know, <laughs> leave things alone. But I had a, a fling rehearsal last night, which was the first time, you know, really kind of taxing my arm for more than maybe 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, you know, we played for a few hours and man, it was, it's great. It really like, I, it's, it's amazing to me how, 
how how much of a difference this made. So yeah, success is is yeah, is an understatement. It. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had that um, LASIK surgery on my eyes, and I remember oh. when I had that. You know, like you y- you slowly don't even realize that you're not seeing well, right? right? But you, then you kind of catch yourself squinting, and then you have that LASIK surgery, and then that first time when you open your eyes and you can see what clear looks like again without glasses, you're like, "Holy cow, this is a freaking miracle!" I mean, yeah. and it, we we get we get excited in the tech industry about a new spreadsheet or a word processor, right? This is crazy technology that that you know fixes your body. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know it's amazing, you know, because you can't buy a new body yet, right? Like you. And you can't really upgrade your body, although I guess we're we're heading into that realm. But um, I, you've upgraded your body with the laser. I upgraded mine by you know having some some things yeah. removed. But fix, yeah, fix some stuff. Fix some stuff. Yeah, it's just it's re- it's really amazing. I'm I'm looking forward to playing gigs this weekend, and and I'm looking forward to having more of these things out. I, I yeah, I think I like I said last time, I had always avoided having my arms operated on because it's such a you know. It's not like my butt where there's or my back where there's some, you know, fatty tissue and stuff like yeah. things are a little more delicate. But um, I asked my surgeon, I'm like, is this like, is this considered? Do you think of this any differently than when you took this out of like, you know, my leg or my butt or whatever? He's like, no, it's the same thing. He says, it's super easy. He's like, we're just going through a couple layers of skin. He's like, it's it's not a big deal. I'm like, OK, OK, I'm glad you feel that way. That's great. Yeah. There it is to me. <laughs> yeah, it is to me. Right, right, right. But um, it, yeah, I was wondering if I would be uh, like because I was nervous going into this for, for those reasons, like, you know, all of that. And I. Once I kind of, you know, laid down on the table and the thing he, we figured out, actually it was between the two of us. He was like, I think you should be on your side. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I think I should be on my stomach to, to expose my arm at the right angle, you know? And he's like, actually yeah. that works. All right, if you're cool like that for, you know, 20, 30 minutes, he's like, this works great. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And as soon as he started, um, I, like I, I decided, I'm like, well, if I, like, I can't worry about this anymore. I, I need to trust that he's the person that I want to do this to me. And if I don't, then I should just get up and leave right now, you know? Right. And, and as soon as I kind of processed that through my, my head, it was like, Oh, I, my, I just totally relaxed. And I was like, okay, yeah, he, it's, it's in his hands. And um, you know, hopefully it works out. <laughs> so thankfully it worked out. So it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm stoked about it. It's really, it's nice when, when a plan comes together. I agree. To quote, was that uh, Hannibal, right? From the A team. I love it when a plan comes together. Yeah. Yeah. Spe- I'm glad to hear you're getting back. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm man. Yep. I'm just kind of freaking me out there for a little while. Um, we got a note from Max, um, for a, a listener to the show and a member of the team that created this app slash service called Mixlo. Uh, it, the whole idea is, to, they've created a regional charting system for streaming music. So, and it, it's an app that you can sign up either as a, you know, a listener, a consumer, or a creator, if you have your own music on, you know, on these services. And then they used, they, they create these location-based charts. And so they show you what, uh, local musicians, which local musicians like are on the rise in your area and different ways you can support them. They use this incentivized tipping system where a hundred percent of the proceeds go to the artist. And, and then, you know, like I said, if you're on the artist side, Mixlo allows you to like plug in your other social media and, and even venues if, if that works out or whatever it's in beta right now, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's really, really cool. Um, th- this idea of just finding, you know, finding music around you, which is, I, I mean, finding music in general is super difficult and being able to find like, you know, what local bands might I want to see and can I go listen to them and like pulling all that together right in the app is great. I, I loved the way that I could just like find a band and then right in the app, start playing their songs. It's like, okay, this is how this should be. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 Cause like I can go to Spotify or Apple music, but I have no way of saying, okay, well find me the, you know, the local bands that I might encounter, Like that that's not seems, part of this. Seems, like 
It's like a smart thing that those places should do, though, right? So yeah, like I agree. It's just a, it's yeah, it's just a metric, right? It's just data, and it seems like they that would be something that 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 would be a a feature that might appear in, in a Spotify or an Apple Music before long. Yeah, it, it, especially if Mixlo is any is successful. Right. Well, that would be the key. Then they would just acquire Mixlo because you know these places they know it's faster to acquire than develop. Well, I mean that's just I've a yeah. It's a it's just a fact of sort of you know that business at that scale. But, um, I, you know, I don't know that this would be a priority for an Apple music or a Spotify, right? Like they're, they're just looking to, I mean, I guess maybe it would be, it depends. Honestly, I bet it depends on, you know, whether we actually enter this roaring twenties I've been predicting for three years or not. Yep. Like, you know, if people really are wanting to leave their houses and go see local bands and all of that. And I think a, they are. Oh, I agree I, with you, but yeah. I mean, booking opportunities in, in all, both where I used to live and where I live now, yeah. have been, there's so much going on and, and, and attendance of the early ones has been great. Mm. Anticipation for the future ones. I mean, we're selling tickets for a May date right now that's going through the roof. I mean, it's, I, I do think, I don't know if it'll last, and, right. or whether it's just you know, right. a knee-jerk reaction and whether you know this is going to be one of those serendipitous things that catapult live music back into people's consciousness consciousness or whether it's just a reaction to having been cooped up largely yeah, for the I want, a, I want a gtfo right yeah 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 yeah, yeah for right sure now right now it, it is the roaring 20s in terms of you know opportunities for for live music it is for me here is are you finding it there yeah for sure the gigs that i mean you know the gigs that we've been playing are, are you know very well attended people you know all basically basic sellouts most of the time uh, at least locally we've got some gigs I, you know i was joking we have our our spread our carbon footprint tour uh here in april meaning that we've got some gigs that are many hours away so well outside of our uh you know our home base one of them we're doing with another band actually with two other bands which is a great way to you know to work in a, in a, in a locale that isn't native to you. Right. To, you know, cause yeah. they'll be bringing, bringing other people out and one of them's not. So I'm curious to see how those gigs go in terms of attendance and, and our ability to draw in faraway lands. Uh, but, um, but yeah, like, I mean, other, you know, the local stuff has been, it's been phenomenal. And that, I mean, that was well, true I even, even over the summer, uh, when we were able to play, it it was the same kind of thing. It was just like, you know, people just super hungry for it. I, I think it's super, super hungry, but I, yeah. I'm actually finding that the number of like restaurants that are adding live music, you know, or, you know, as a competitive yeah. thing, because so many other restaurants are, again, the wineries are all opening up. One that's kind of interesting to me, this might just be my view of the world because I'm seeing it more in my Facebook feed, but sure. Seems like there are a lot more small regional three day music festivals. Not the not the big ones that you agree to know. I, yeah, it seems like those things like campgrounds are now now doing you know one weekend of a music festival. But and you go look at the headliners, there's nobody that I've ever heard of before. But it seems like and they're you know rural Michigan, rural North Carolina, uh, certainly several in California. It seems like the music festivals of a different scale are starting to explode. I agree with that. I, yeah. I'm, I am finding out about re yeah. Regional music festivals. That's a good way to put it. And they've existed before. Like this is not an entirely new concept. Uh, I've even played some of them before, but they certainly seems like there are lots more of them and, and they seem to be doing well. Uh, I mean, like, they haven't been happening yet. They'll be happening this summer for us because, you know, it's not warm enough here to ask people to spend a weekend outside quite yet. But um, but we're getting there, you know. And so, yeah, it, there there are a lot of these. I'm, I, I think and also hope that they they thrive. But I, I think they will. I think people are into this. People, you know, instead of spending a weekend home, go go camp and and enjoy some music and just hang out. Yeah. And, that, you know, the nice part about a regional festival as opposed to like a, you know, a, a, a Bonnaroo or, you know, something like that is the stakes are much lower in terms of being an attendee. Like you're, you know, the cost is less, the distance you have to travel is less, the amount of people you're going to need to like fight with 
not that you'd fight, but, you know, the amount of people you're going to have to encounter and sort of deal with in terms of crowds and bathrooms and food, you know, all of that stuff is just less. And so it's also, probably more laid back and more maybe if you, if you know, if for the people who want to be socially distant, probably much easier to do that at a place like this, you know, or one of these regional festivals. Yeah. Some of them are just because of the scale in all ways. You know, if you do, you know, Lollapalooza, you have to find a place to hold that many people. Right. But a lot of these more regional ones are like beautiful locations on lakes or yeah. know, in the mountains or, where, yeah. you know, they're expecting – one to 5,000 people instead of, you know, 50 to 100,000 people. Right. And, you know, they figured out they can make their money, but, you know, with that type of a scale. And there, there it seems like they're in some really, really beautiful locations. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know. It, it's, it's, we've had a couple of them reach out to us. I think, I think we're going to wind up doing one or two of them this summer nice. with Bitter Pill, too. Yeah. I know. I'm, I'm eager to see how it all works. It's, you know, so that, many that, beautiful places are all around New England that it seems like would be make perfect, perfect. sense for, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think there's a, a weed farm up in Maine that that wants to get us on board for their festival, and Bitter Pill would be a perfect band for that for a variety of reasons. So there um, you go. So that's one. But you know, but I mean, like that. But like they and they have their own land, right? Like that's they don't even need to, you know go and like rent a campground or whatever for the weekend. It's like these farms have their own places. And so, yeah, I know I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to how it's all going to, it's going to be different. The, you know, the next couple of years, I think a lot of things are reinvented and you know, that's why you are going to want to make sure that you have your band's electronic press kit set up. And that's why our sponsor band Zoogle is here for you. Because Banzoogle is this all-in-one platform that makes it super easy to build a beautiful website and your electronic press kit for your music. They, they've taken care of all of the nitty-gritty so that you can just show up and build your site without knowing how to build a site. They know how to do that. They've built like all of these. They've got dozens of these templates that are fully customizable. So you kind of start with the framework that, that works for you, but then you're going to be putting your own pictures in, you're setting your own colors, you're setting, you know, just exactly how things are going to look, but it's super easy. And if you've got your own custom domain name, or if you want your own custom domain name, highly recommend having your own custom domain name, by the way, you definitely want to be able to own your brand. They can take care of that for you. They make that super easy as well. If you want to sell your music, your merch, they have all the tools to do that and integrate it into your site, all commission free. In addition, all the crowdfunding and fan subscription features they have also commission free mailing list tools to grow and maintain your fan list, send newsletters. Guess what? Commission free, all the social media integrations you need and live support seven days a week from their musician friendly team. They guess what? They're musicians. They have figured this stuff out. They know what we need. Because they are we. They just happen to be geeks that know how to build websites too. And so they built this engine for us. It's amazing. As as a oh go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. They probably built it for themselves as musicians first. I would imagine. Somebody might like this. (laughs) Somebody else might want this. No, that's probably true. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, And because you're a Gig Gab podcast listener, you can go to bandzoogle.com. You get to try it free for 30 days. And then you use our promo code GIGGAB. That's all one word. G-I-G-G-A-B. And you get 15% off your first year of any subscription. So Banzoogle.com, promo code GIGGAB. And uh, yeah, our thanks to Banzoogle for sponsoring this episode. It's great stuff. Super service. Yeah. I'm a very happy customer. I know. Yeah, it's great. It's great. So you've been playing some gigs, man. You, uh, yeah, and you've I, got you know, some gigs coming up. This. Yeah. Yeah. My, my calendar is going to be, I'm going to have a great summer. I'm just so excited about it. The That's House awesome. Rockers have great gigs. I mean, I mean, my deal with the guys when I moved down here was I'm going to block out these weekends, hold those for me. Okay. And, you know, and if I don't book them by March 31st, I'll turn them back. But I booked them. Sure. You know, we have we have a great schedule playing huge shows, beautiful places. It, it, it's really good. So I, uh, I want to I, I want to take, you know, a 30 to 90 seconds and just art, have you articulate what what you did with your band, because yeah. I, I think this is, there is a, an actionable lesson here for not every band, but many bands 
So yeah, walk through that with a little more detail because I, I really think it's important. So when I announced to the guys that I was going to be moving away and that some things were going to be changing in terms of the frequency that we were going to gig, I knew that human nature being what it is and guys who have been in bands, you know, have seen this played out before and there's going to be doubt that, you know, I, I would really follow through and keep the band together. Sure. And so I knew that I, I wanted to give them an actionable plan that, that was going to you know, something they could understand and measure against, you know, whether they are actually measuring it or the whether they can just say to themselves, oh, he did what he said he was going to do. So what my deal was is that January through May, I was going to come up one weekend a month uh, and then May through September, two weekends a month. And a weekend is typically probably a, probably a Thursday through Sunday, sometimes a Wednesday through Sunday, sometimes a Wednesday through Saturday. But what I did was I blocked those weekends out and I said, hey, guys, on our shared calendar, you see the weekends we have. Hold those dates for me until March 31st. If I don't have a book by March these, 31st. These are the summer dates you were asking them to hold until March yeah. 31st. Okay. I just yeah, wanted, yeah. To, yes, or, yeah, I wanted to make sure people understand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, probably in October, November, I, I had booked uh, January, February, March, you know, the, sure. the winter months. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then those weekends that I had booked, they were, you know, nice thing about having a 20 year track record is I know some of the things that we're most likely going to get invited back to and sure. when those festivals or concerts are. And it, there was a whole bunch of good that comes from it because you, you know, like you and I've talked about this concept of scarcity is a very powerful thing in booking. So I also sent a note out to all the people who have booked us over the past several years saying, Hey, um, we're going to be playing a little bit less next year, only a couple weekends a month. The good thing is, by us playing less, there should be more demand for people to come see us. The bad thing is, you know, there's less dates available. Got to get in on and it, that, yeah. <laughs> and so that got a lot of that got a lot of early booking. So I was well on the way to filling those dates, and the guys in the band saw that the dates were in fact filling up. And sure enough, you know, certainly by the end of March, I was done. I mean, our our summer was booked all the way through September. I delivered on what I promised the guys that I would do. Hopefully, that's a good proof of concept that this that this will work, you know, and they have their other musical lives, whatever they, that might be, other groups, other projects, sure. you know, teaching, whatever it might be. And there's a, there's a new type of order. Every once in a while, something will come in, in between those dates that I've reserved. And I have to evaluate it for the usefulness of me driving up, um, the usefulness of me kind of interrupting the, asking the other guys to interrupt the rest of their musical lives. Sure. Uh, so it is good, you know, the, I, in this kind I of like, hybrid life we have. I, I like this. And it, like, it, certainly with a, a band like yours, we're, you know, effectively a leader led band. And, you know, I realize that's a, that's a nuanced conversation we've been having for seven years, but, <laughs> it, it, but like, I could also see this idea working for, uh, you know, even a, a, a band that is less leader led, you know, a more sort of, you know, uh, you know, uh, democratic band, if you will, where you say, okay, here are the dates we will agree to carve out for the summer. And these are the dates we're going to focus on booking, leaving these other dates open. You know, if you're in a scenario like, like you are, where you've got you, you know, needs to need to schedule your life to come up and do these gigs. You can't just like leave your house and drive 20 minutes and go play a show. Right. You know, you've got to do this and then right. allowing everybody, if you've got bandmates with, specific, you know, pulls on their lives, knowing well in advance, okay, here are the weekends to carve out. Here are the weekends that, you know, are, are not reserved for the band. I, I could see that really kind of working, even if it wasn't a leader led scenario, you know, kind of like you're talking about here where you're reserving their time. You can reserve one another's time too. I, I like there's, it doesn't, it's not going to work for every band, but I, I liked it when you talked to me about it, you know, kind of off the air. And I wanted to make sure we shared it. So thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. And like I said, you know, part of it was to get some predictability into our lives. Part of it was to prove to the guys that even though I was moving sure. far enough away for them, you know, that they could have doubt that, you know, there was A, first was a plan and B, that the plan is what got followed through on. Right, right. Buy-in is everything, right? You know, buy-in oh, yeah. is is what keeps us on the same page stuff. And, and in my group, some of the guys... All of their income comes from music. They teach and then they gig. And so, you know, they they have over the years come to prioritize my band because I've given them the most work. Now, I would like to think I'm still giving them the most work 
or the best work. Sure. Um, but, you know, it, it, I think that's part of being in a band is, you know, everyone is constantly, and there's leverage on both sides. There's leverage on, there's, everybody has leverage. You sure. Know, it's, it's inconvenient to replace a guy who's not happy anymore or, or, it, or the band isn't satisfying what he wants in terms of frequency or quality or, you know, quantity. Sure. Or, or, you know, quality meaning are they good gigs? Quality meaning do they pay well? You know, whatever it is. That is that is a process that musicians go through. Some guys, you know, just want to be in a group. And, right. You know, they just want someone to take care of everything. They will gleefully lend their talents uh, as long as all they have to do is show up and play. And some guys, that's what they need out of a group. And, uh, you know, it, there's I have all different types of situations in my group. So I just try to... No, I think it's, I just, it's a, to, I just, I like the, the formula, regardless of the reasons for it. I, I think that yeah. the formula in and of itself is fantastic. I, I, like it. there's, there's, yeah. And I, my guess is a lot of people could benefit from it, it, it no matter what the, the makeup and, you know, organizational structure of their band is. So, yeah. yeah I agree. All right. So I, so, I, I well, derailed you, about but thank you. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Well, I mean, kind of continuing in the same vein, talking about formulas. So my life now is. I have the house rockers as my band. Yep. I play solo acoustic gigs. And then, you know, when I moved down here, I had no intention of getting anything other than solo work because everything was going to be, that would be enough. Sure. But sure enough, one of the places that I really like playing have said, Hey, we're not doing solos on Fridays or Saturdays anymore. Any chance you have a duo or, you know, or a small band. That right. You bring yeah. In. I remember you telling us about this. Yeah. Yeah. And so I thought about it for a little while and, um, I happen to have made a contact down here who's a well-known singer in, in the area that I am. He's super. Hey, he's a super guy. I, he was just like, when I came down here, I was trying to figure out who are the good bands. This guy's band, you know, clearly to me, this guy was a total pro. They were doing great music. He was a fantastic singer. So when I moved down here, I said, hey, you know, I'm a new, mu new musician in town. Can we grab some lunch? And we went out and kind of hit it off on a friendship level. And, you know, he was really gracious, really helpful. And um, and when they asked about a duo, I, you know, just said, hey, would you have any interest? He goes, yeah, sounds like fun. Because it's not a lot. It's like, I think we have four gigs booked. And, sure. you know, he, he does solo work and he's got a band. And he goes, no, it sounds like fun. So we got together two times, just ran through a bunch of stuff. And we went and did our first gig. That was really fun. They'd asked about it. The venue had asked about a trio first. And so... That was an interesting uh, process of me trying to find a bass player and a drummer. The bass player I wanted to work with uh, was still COVID shy when this came up. And so he wasn't available. So I had to find something else. And I actually, believe it or not, I found someone who had posted an ad on Craigslist of all places. Huh. And uh, he just said the right things in his, in his post. I invited him over. We jammed. Turned out like it was, you know, the essence of a good, a good thing. Similar wants, similar stations to life. And then the, the drummer that I found is actually someone who ran in the same circles as me up in the Bay Area who had moved down here. And we had a lot of similar friends. And we'd met a couple of times, but we'd never played. I called him up, and and uh, and he actually is a solo artist now. He self-produced a couple albums, and uh, he's been putting a lot of energy in that. But he was free for stuff down here. So we did our first gig on Saturday. Four, and it was funny because it was four hours on Friday, four hours on Saturday. So it was a lot of playing this Ooh. weekend. That's, that's but, a sort of long gig. Yeah, yeah. It was how do you, you structure that as three sets? Is that how you generally do a, approach a four hour gig? Uh, nope, four sets. Oh. And, I, and actually forcing yeah. myself to really do 45, you know, and 15, for, you know, and then the last set's an hour um, is, is the way that we go. So you do the long set last. Oh, well, yeah. Actually, there's no. There's not enough data, Dave, to okay. say how I'm going to do it forever. That's yeah, how I did it this That's week. how you did it this weekend. Yeah, okay, right, right. Yeah, I always, like, when we play those gigs at the Gaslight, like those Monkey Fist gigs there, that's a 7 to 11, so it's a four-hour slot, obviously. Uh -huh. And we have found that we are much better off if we make the first set the long one. That makes sense. Yeah, you know, just, just to put it in the bank. chunk out of the night. Yeah, yeah. exactly, right. No, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Yeah. But talking about systems and how you do things, so I had I had to come up with a spreadsheet and figure out, you know, what are my songs that are in common and try and leverage as much of my time of what I was going to learn. And so I started out with my solo set, and how many of those are going to be good songs for 
Oh, and then up in the Bay Area, you know, I have that coffee shop band that sits in with me. That's just kind of like a yeah. Paul Kenton friends guys who you know sit in. Sure. So I, I, you know, I I finalize who who those guys are regularly. My good buddy Joe Rizzi's back drumming with me, which I'm really oh, happy about. Oh, that's really nice. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chris Breen is in that, right? Yep. And um, so I literally had to set out a spreadsheet and say, okay, my house rocker stuff I only want to do with the house rocker, so I don't even I don't even go there. But solo stuff, the coffee shop band. The duo, and remember, there's what I want to do in the duo, and then what the guy I'm singing with, what he wants to do. So, you know, there's a couple songs to add there. Sure. And then there's this new trio that I'm doing. So I try and have as much consistency across um, to keep my life as sane as possible. So I came out with this crazy complicated spreadsheet where I'm kind of matching across the line, you know, yeah, what, yeah. where are the common songs, where are the common songs. And then, like, the songs that Chet brought in for our duo, a lot of them are awesome. Never heard them before. And I want to, you know, use them. So they kind of, now I know they're in the duo, so I'm going to, you know, those would be top candidates for the next ones to add to the trio or the coffee shop band. So, yep. uh, you know, process, 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 staying organized. It, it's so funny. I don't know if, if you find this when you do your unplug sets, but I must know, I must know 150 songs cold and then bits and pieces of another 200 songs, right? Right, sure. But if I sit down to do a solo gig, and I finish the song. <laughs> if I haven't thought ahead of what the next song is going to be. You know, zero songs. That's right. Paralysis. <laughs> Absolute paralysis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What you actually know is none. No songs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm a big fan of, you know, building a set list, even if you know you're not going to follow it. Like, yeah. I, I, I really, I appreciate, I mean, A, just the process of building it forces me to think about, you know, how would two songs work together? You know, that whole, I like, I love this process that, uh, and uh, it, it, this is, it's not a complaint, but it is one of the things that being in bitter pill has been a little weird because we've got both Billy and Emily who have taken over set list creation duties, uh, not taken over. They have simply done them. They they've always done them and it's great. Like they build great sets. I have like zero complaints. We play great gigs, but it's weird for me showing up at a gig not having thought about what songs work together or whatever. And then when those moments happen, you know, where it's like, oh, we need to stretch or we need to do something. I feel like I'm at a loss because I haven't put in the time to think about, oh, here's all the songs we have. We're going to whittle it down to, you know, this subset of them to do the gig. And then, but I know the rest in the back of my head. I mean, I like you, I, I know what the songs are that we're going to play. And if they call any one of them, I'll, I like, I'll play it. Like I know the song, but to think of them on the spot, especially without that, you know, for me, that paralysis. mental prep, it's paralysis. Yep. It's like, yeah, we, we, we know that's it. Uh, like we we know one song. That's it. Like the, 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 I don't know anything else. So yeah, it's it. I, I, in monkey fist, if I don't build a set list, we will play the entire gig, including those four hour gaslight gigs with no set list. And and that is what happens most of the time with Monkey Fist. But we do have a song list that we keep out on stage to remind yeah. us of what we have. Yeah. And we're all very much on the same page of knowing sort of the basics of, well, don't burn all your great songs right here because, you know, then the last set is crumbs and that sucks, yeah. you know. So it, it usually works out, but it it's almost always better if – a set list is built, even if you wind up calling audibles because you know it works. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I get it. I, I derailed this again. On the on the topic of of set list, it, it's interesting. Last year, because we had almost no rehearsal time, and we had just agreed we're just going to pull our A list stuff out of our song list, and we're going to play those, you know, for the whole summer. Yeah, we had mostly the same set list, and I actually I really liked it. It was like a comfortable comfortable yeah. glove you know it was just yeah. like you show up and you let it flow and you know there's no risk there's not not is this song going to work or you know is this transition going to work i kind of liked it there are constituencies in my group who say no 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 we have enough people come to see us multiple times where we need to you know mix it up and i personally i think part of that is their own boredom sure and part of it i think is <clears throat> Well, my response is how many people, like, as opposed to 
you know, in any one gig, how many people are seeing us and they're only going to see us once in a month yep. or, you know, if that. Yeah. Why once all summer. Right. Like show. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's the kind of give and take is like, how much are we fish and how much are we, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, how, how much are people like spending their whole summer? We, we have some fans who come to see us multiple times. Yep. I, uh, but that, that there's the trade off right there is, is, um, you know, do you want to put your best song list and your best show out there every time? I, I have, I have a lot of thoughts about, list? about that because it, it, you're, you're right. Like, you know, fish is a great example of a band that, you know, the same people will come to see the band, you know, multiple nights in a row or every night if they can, mm -hmm. because they know it's going to be a different show every night. That, is is something that is intentionally created by a band though right yeah. so like you can you can choose to head down that path and have a different set list every night and making sure that your fans know that they might be more likely to come and see you multiple nights in a row right yeah. but the flip side is exactly what you're saying here where you know if you're bouncing around and playing shows not to the same fan base every night there's a lot of, lot of benefit and a lot of strength in having at the very least a core show. You might swap out a song or two here. And that's basically what bitter pill did last summer was, you know, I say that Billy and Emily write the set list and they do, but there's, you know, there's very much a core set where it's like, yeah, this is, this is our show. And okay, today we're going to swap this song in here, or maybe move this song to the second set or not play this song for a few gigs just to give it a little bit of rest and then maybe bring it back. But, you know, the, the, the hits or the songs that we want to be hits, we're playing those mm -hmm. every gig. You know, we're getting people into them. We're getting ourselves into them. Um, so, yeah, I like there's, there's, there's benefits to both. You, you can make both work, but you kind of have to be committed. If you're going to do the different set list every gig, you really need to work on communicating that and engaging with your crowd on that so that you have a crowd at every gig, because that almost by definition means you're not playing your strongest songs every single time you go out. And, and that can hurt you if you're not managing that properly. So I yeah, agree. yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, that the issue of uh, that it's about boredom in the band is really an interesting thing, right? I, and I can imagine that this, there's a wide range of perspectives on this. You know, if I'm bored, I'm not giving you my best show. Right. Or, you know, or, you know, the flip side is, you know, professional musicians that are in the pit band or, you know, or touring, like many touring bands play the same. Right? It's a show. It's not, it's, it's not, show. it's not individual concerts that happen to be strung together. It is a, a show that is performed in different cities it, it, for, for some bands. Like it's, it depends. Yeah. Yeah. My, my only other thought to this is what I found last year, which is the first time we've really been that anal about the same show. Like we, yeah. we have a mostly the same show that we've done in years past. Sure. It was so tight and so enjoyable to play yeah. about halfway through the summer that, you know, it, it, I, I, I enjoyed it a lot more. There were no question marks whether something was going to go over you know, it was our best material. And so, you know, it, it was going over. You didn't have to think about it. Right. You, you know, you didn't have to think about, well, if this guy didn't prepare for that song, what else does he not know? And, you know, kind of <laughs> hesitational yeah, what, paralysis that you get. What's the question mark? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What, what, what minefield am I walking into next? Yeah. That's yep. right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That, no, that there's, there's strength to it. Like I said, I, that, that was a big part of our, our success with bitter pill last summer. I think was that we by and large played the same show. It wasn't exactly the same, although sometimes it was, you know, it's just like, Hey, that set worked last Saturday. Should we just do the same one? Yeah. You know, the band would be like, yeah, that sounds good to me. Like, and, and it's, you know, that conversation was more, was as much about d did we think it worked and should we do it again as Hey, is there a song that we didn't do last weekend that you want to play? You know, if so, speak now and we'll figure out a way to mix it into the set, you know? So, yep. um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I like it. And, it, you know, that has also played, paid well for us and played well for us in the gigs that we've been doing this winter because we didn't have a lot of opportunity to rehearse. And so, you know, we showed up like at that flight coffee gig in January. Mm -hmm. Where it was like, well, we haven't played, 
you know, we haven't played together since we were in the studio, uh, you know, a month and a half before that. And we haven't played these songs because we weren't playing. Mostly we weren't playing the new songs that we had recorded. So it had been, you know, several months since we had played many of them. It was like, okay, well, you know, we played these songs, you know, 25 times over the summer. They're locked in. Let's hope they stayed that way, you know, and the gig went great. But it, it really helped us. It was like, okay, let's pull out a set list from last summer, maybe add in one thing that we think we can get away with from the new record that, you know, we're, we're comfortable doing and then we'd just play. And we, you know, we slayed at that gig. We slayed at the gig that we played at that punk club down in, in, uh, in Lowell in Massachusetts. And it's, it's because we were playing the set that we knew. It matters. It makes a difference. <laughs> so. It also makes that. It makes the solo sections actually more effective because if that's truly where the expression is going to come and everything else is just a rock solid bedrock yeah. that the whole band just you know sits on like a comfortable pillow, it, it actually makes the expressive sections of the show, I think, more dramatic. It does. It, both for the audience and for the band. Yeah, you know, I, I, I yep. I, I look forward to those, those sections. It's like, okay, like here, now we can. We can dive off the cliff a little bit here because we know even if this completely falls apart, which is probably not going to, you know, but the, the next song on the list is going to be solid. Like, there's no question. It's like, OK, so, yeah, give ourselves a little. We've earned this. We'll go, you know, enjoy this little moment that's a, a in the moment detour. And then the next thing we'll enjoy is playing a song we know. Yeah, I don't. If nothing else. You could make the argument that do many shows with your best stuff to get the band on the same page and in a great gel. Yeah. And then it probably opens up the ability for you to take a couple of risks a little bit later. That's fair. There's nothing, nothing else is at risk. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You, you have a, you have a foundation of things that, you know, if, you know, I always call them back pocket tunes when I was building fling set lists where it was like, I need stuff in my back. pocket. like a lot of our best songs would not be on the set list. And it was because I knew that we were going to wind up calling audibles. Like we had gotten to that yeah. point and, and it was like, you know, people would ask like, I can't believe you didn't put this on the list. It's like, Oh, we'll be playing it tonight. I just don't know when we'll be playing it tonight. And usually it's either, you know, the, the crowd is like thing. If the things are going well, well, we can throw these songs in and keep things going well, or things aren't going so well. I know that we can throw these in and turn it around. <laughs> so, yeah, that was those back pocket tunes. The first couple of gigs that we did them, you know, with the guys were like, man, I can't, like, we really should be playing these songs. It's like, oh, no, 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 we will be. Trust me. <laughs> Wait till the end of the gig and, and then let's have a conversation. I, I yeah. think I got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Fun stuff. I like this. Yeah. yeah. I'm Speaking of. I'm glad your surgery went well, though, Dave. Oh, man. Like, yes, you and me both. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. It, it's really now. I, like I said, I am noticing things about my right arm and it's like, yeah, okay. I got to get like, I have a couple of these things that in time would probably cause greater issues than I had with my left arm. So it's like, but you know, all in due time, it'll, it'll happen. Yeah. I'm, I'm good for these gigs coming up. So I'm happy about that. We got anything else or is, uh, was this the, uh, where we call it the end. This is not, what we call the end. Not the end forever, but uh, no. the end for a couple of weeks. We got some scheduling things uh, in in the mix here that'll mean that I think we're off for the next two weeks, and then and then we'll be back uh, before April ends. So I'll be able to report on uh, on our our uh, spread our carbon footprint tour here, and uh, and all kinds of things we'll be able to report on. So and then we'll be in, we'll be talking about summer stuff. And we'll be talking about summer stuff. Yeah. Let us know how things are going for you. Let us know what you think about like managing your, your bandmate schedules and your musical calendars and all of that stuff. Like the more ideas we have in here, the better off we all are. So feedback at giggabpodcast.com or at our Facebook group, which is giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. That'll, that'll redirect you there. And it's the easiest way to get there. So we'd love to see you over there. And, uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see you next time. We'll let the band play us out. What's that thing we say, man? Always be performing. Always be performing. Yeah, I like it. That's what I'm going to do this weekend. Looking forward to it. In fact. Later. Later.